Hello and welcome to Russ Plays Games. My name is Russ and as you can see I am sitting in front of my paint station which means it's time for the paint tutorial. And um, I'm going to uh, tell you right now that uh, last time um, when I when I last did a paint tutorial video, um, I had actually painted this little pillar that I was going to use for my um, uh, for my warlord necropolis army um, as a pillar of evil, and I had to purge some footage, and I ended up purging that one, which was stupid. I know, um, but it happens. So, um, didn't get to see me paint this, but we will finish it, because the last time that we did things, we finished it. Now, in the interim, okay, I was looking at a game from Modiphius Entertainment, or Modiphius Games, called Elder Scrolls Call to Arms, and I ended up purchasing the Imperial Faction starter set. This is... Um, you get Hadvar, an Imperial Mage, and three Imperial Troops, okay? And so I think what I'm going to do is, is after I get done painting this, we will paint up the Imperial Mage. I think that might be kind of fun to paint up. Um, just as something a little different than our normal thing, as you, um, well, can't really see, but I have a few of the guys in various states of dismemberment, because you actually have to build every single one. Now, what's really cool, um, about this is that <clears throat> this gives you the entire sprue, okay, and which ones are labeled, and the sprue itself actually contains all of this information as well, so it actually will say, like, E1, E4, you know, all this stuff, okay? And it also gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to put them together, okay? So it shows you how to put each and every single figure in the box together. Now, I will say this, the models are a bit on the expensive side. And I mentioned this before in one of my other videos, where actually when I was buying the skeletons here, okay, which, in fact, I mentioned that I was going to purchase some Elder Scrolls Call to Arms skeletons, and they were like $50. So they're extremely expensive. Just know that, okay? But... This box was $33 at my local game store, okay? My friendly local game store. So, um, the starter sets are not that expensive, okay? And some of their expansion sets aren't that expensive either. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Just know that if you're going to buy these, all you get in the box... You get five bases, you get the instructions with the sprue and how to put them together, and you get the sprue with each character. So, like, here's Hadbar, okay? That's what you get. That's it. Just so you know, okay? Um, and, and that means that if you're going to buy into this game, that's all you're going to get in your starter set. Which means that if you're going to buy into the game, you have to go online, or if your game store has it, my game store didn't, um, you have to buy the boxed set that says um, Elder Scrolls Call to Arms um, Core Set. Okay, And it's a box that contains counters, decks of cards, um, Everything, basically, that you need to play besides the miniatures and a tape measure. <laughs> that's about it, okay? Um, and terrain. That's it. Um, now, what's really cool is if you go to Modiphius' website, okay? And I'll leave a link below to Modiphius. If you want to check this out, I'll leave a link below. And you can go down and you can check out Modiphius. 
Um, and you can look at their Elder Scrolls um, Call to Arms stuff. They have released a lot of different things. And they've also been releasing terrain, like Skyrim-themed terrain. Because this is basically Skyrim. I didn't realize this. Because, I mean, it's like I was looking at it, and I was kind of like, yeah, it's got some stuff from Skyrim. I didn't realize it. This is Skyrim the Miniatures game. <laughs> okay? So this is literally Skyrim the Miniatures game. Okay? And you'll probably notice that I'm wearing a new shirt. Okay? This is um, this is uh, God the Father Apparel. And I'll leave a link down below if you'd like to buy a shirt similar to this. Um, with a code for 15% off. <clears throat> okay. So let's jump in here. Here are. Oh, now don't you start. Okay, so what we're looking for on this is we're going to be highlighting all these little folds and um, like these skulls on here, anywhere there's kind of an edge or kind of a kind of a bump or ridge, we're going to highlight. And my stinking brush. Being real temperamental right now. I need to get a new one. Normally I can get it come to a pretty good point and stay that way for a little while, but sometimes it's like, no, don't like you. Everybody's been having a good time out there. Hope everybody had a good Valentine's Day. Didn't have a Valentine's. Didn't have a Valentine. Didn't have a Valentine's Day for myself. But as I'm older than dirt, I just celebrated my birthday. So I hope everyone out there has been having a good year so far. Things are crazy. Actually got to play for the first time the new Hero Quest. I mean, it's the same as the old Hero Quest, but I got to play it, which was kind of fun. Everybody had fun, and everything was really cool. We had a lot of fun playing it, and we think it was really well done. So. <clears throat> the only thing was the board was a tiny bit off um, in terms of how it fit together. It's the, the, it was a little warped right in the middle, so like one of the one of the doors didn't sit quite right. I mean, not that big of a deal, but you know, 
it is what it is. Didn't detract from the overall fun factor, but it was definitely something where people were like, um, is this normal? I'm like, uh, yeah, it's a brand new board game. I've never played it. So I said, I'm expecting it to kind of be uh, a little, little off here and there. <laughs> I backed a couple new games on Kickstarter. I think I mentioned one, Darkest Doom. That one's, I can't wait to get my hands on it. Another one I backed was Order 1947. That's actually a really good one, too. I'm looking forward to it. So. Just do one side of this, just so you guys can kind of see, because it's basically three sides of the same coin. So I'll do three sides, and then we can kind of move on to other things. You guys want to sit here and see me try to do this three times a month. <laughs> now this is going to be tedious as all hell. Get a chance to play some Dragon Strike for the first time in who knows how long. Dragon Strike, of course, is a 1993 board game. It has an infamous video that, if you've never seen, you absolutely have to see it. And if you're as familiar as I am with American Gladiators, then it's a must-see, especially if you're familiar with the original American Gladiators. Because one of the original American Gladiators, who went by the name of Malibu, was in the video. Um, so if you search Dragon Strike 1993 on YouTube, you'll see... And some people have uploaded the video, and it is absolutely awesome. Like I said, if you haven't seen it, definitely check it out. It's hilarious as all hell. It's one of those things where it's so cheesy it's good. So if you if you love things that are just, like, so cheesy it's good, and that's, like, your jam, definitely check that out, because it will absolutely blow your mind. And even if you aren't, it's still just a really good watch. 
um, because it has decent, um, this is before the days of uh, the MCU and, and um, you know, and, and episode one and, and Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within, where, you know, it's like CG was like in mainstream use. And this was actually like one of the first videos that had actually tried to marry the technology between, you know, computer generated graphics and um, live action. And while, like I said, it cheesy as all hell, it's still uh, really good. Like, you know, some of the fight scenes that they do and like some of the different things that they have in it are actually pretty well done. Um, and there was a, a guy um, named Hannibal TV who interviewed um, Darren McBee, who is who was Malibu on the American Gladiators, and he played um, the warrior in the Dragon Strike video. And he asked him about that. He goes, "I gotta ask you about Dragon Strike." And of course, Darren McBee's like, "Oh my God, I can't believe it." And he goes, can you believe, like, just how many people, like, how much of a cult following that video has garnered over the last, like, 10, 15 years? And, and he goes, he goes, no, he goes, I, he goes, I actually, he goes, they send us a copy of the videotape, like, you know, six months after we made it. He goes, because we were on a, on a set that was just basically just blue everywhere it was everything was blue and they said like this is the this is the king's table this is you know this this is that and he goes and we're we're literally he goes a lot of the time when you see us looking at something or you know looking at something yeah they're not there he goes just like on today's you know sets you know where you see people and they're absolutely looking at absolutely nothing and you know you you kind of you kind of say, oh, okay, well, you know, they're just, you know, it's like, because they're reacting to, you know, like on a Transformers movie or something where it's like, they're trying to react to Optimus Prime, but Optimus Prime isn't really there. And they may or may not actually have anything there to, for the actors to look at. And he goes, we were actually kind of on the cusp of that because he goes, we absolutely had nothing to react to. And he goes, so if a dragon was standing there, you know, they're like, uh, there's a dragon there. And you're like, uh, okay. Okay, what am I supposed to do with that information? Like, how am I supposed to react to that? You know, it's like, well, react as if you would react if you were a warrior or something, you know? Like, you want to beat it up with your sword, or you want to do this with it, or whatever. And um, and so he he kind of talked about some of his things, and um, so it was pretty interesting. I'll, um, I'll leave a link down below to that interview as well, um, just because I think that'll be kind of neat um for you guys to watch if, especially if you're familiar with the dragon strike video and if not i'll leave a will leave a link down to uh the dragon strike video as well so that if you've never had the pleasure you will will after that and you're gonna go at first you're gonna go oh my gosh that was kind of cheesy but then you're gonna want to watch it again and you're gonna go you know this is actually kind of fun <laughs> um because what it was supposed to be originally was um like, there had been video board games before this. Games that used VCRs and things to make, um, to have things. But this one, um, I think a lot of people made the mistake of thinking that the, that the Dragon Strike video was supposed to be somehow some kind of like an instructional video on it and it wasn't it was just a it was just a video just to kind of get you in the mood um it had a few instructional things on it um and if you're familiar with james rolf aka the anger video game nerd and his series board james um he he did the dragon strike back in his first season of board james and he kind of chopped up the video and kind of threw it up on there and, you know, kind of made a little fun of it. But even he was like, this is cool. He was like, this is so awesome. Like, this is like the weirdest inclusion in a board game ever. 
And, um, and it's like, yeah, it was the weirdest inclusion to a board game ever. But back in 1993, when I was like 13 years old, I absolutely loved it. I thought it was the best thing ever. Because, like Darren McBee said, I had never seen anything like that before. And it was so weirdly revolutionary that it was like, what in the world am I watching? I love this. <laughs> you know, and if and if somebody had told us that in, like, what, eight years, that we were going to see photorealistic characters well it's nine years we were going to see a photorealistic cgi character interacting and i mean yeah in a way you could say that that episode one did it first but like lord of the rings with Gollum, okay really set the bar and a lot of people don't realize this jar jar was the first because he was kind of the one where it was like oh my gosh there's this character that's waltzing around on screen talking with people and he's annoying as all hell. But then you sit down and you actually look at, you know, Lord of the Rings and you go, it's the same thing as Phantom Menace, only done a hundred times better because he's a main character. He's a villain and he's part of the story not forced in there because oh we need to make sure that this technology works for the rest of my series <laughs> okay um because that's kind of why george lucas put um jar jar in episode one was he needed to make sure that for the the rest of the series going forward that his you know that that his creations were you know that that they were going to be able to do what they needed to do like when they did episode two, where it's like pretty much every single clone trooper at the very end of the movie is all CG. Most people don't realize that. You know, if you go back and watch it, they are all CG. Okay. But they wouldn't have been able to do that had they not done Jar Jar. Because he was kind of the first... And he was the one that needed to be, you know, he was the one that needed to work for that to work. Okay? Because if that didn't work, then, well, the rest of it didn't work. But, I mean, if you go back, you know, Flint Dilly, I mean, he did it. In 1993, with Dragon Strike, he had, you know, they had CG and animated different things all interacting with their characters, with their live action actors. And they called it hyper reality. Okay. And I think it was kind of one of those things where it was originally um, supposed to be a running series of adventure board games. They called it Adventure Vision. Um, it didn't end up working out, but that's what they called it. And, um, and they had actually, and in fact, Darren said that they had actually filmed a second, um, a second video, um, that was, um, called like out among adventure among the stars or something like that because it was supposed to be spell jammer based um instead of like i think for well for dragon strike it takes place in an unnamed kingdom but i think that kingdom is actually supposed to be in forgotten realms because they use king halver the second who was a forgotten realms character in second edition um AD and D and the Spellfire CCG. In fact, I actually have the card of Halver the Second for um, for that. So, um, and I was kind of like, oh, and it's funny because in the um, first edition, um, uh, 
uh, guide um, under Halver the Second, they actually mention that, like, like most people will remember Halver the Second is the really crazy dude from the Dragon Strike video in the board included in the board game, and it's like, yeah, but I mean, honestly. You could use that card of Halver the Second and say that that's the guy that not the guy in the video, but like this is the actual King Halver. <laughs> um, and people would go, "Oh, cool." Which I think I'm going to do when I do that this week. I think I'm going to bring that with me, and I'm going to use that. And just say, this is King Halver the <laughs> Second. Not the weird dude on the video. I don't know who the hell that guy was, but. Not King Halver. Not the real King Halver, let's put it that way. He's a pretender to the throne. Kill him. I'm joking. But no, they had a really good. Uh, they had a really good. Yeah, Dragon Strike actually did really well. Because um, once you look past its weird video and, and, like, kind of strange marketing, like, the game itself is actually really well put together. Because it mimics D&D &D more than, um, than HeroQuest did. Because you have a few different dice that you roll from, but you're rolling from normal dice. You don't have the bespoke dice that you have in the, in the, in the Hero Quest board game. And so, you know, you try to look at, you know, if you're, if you're looking at something that's a lot more in line with Dungeons & Dragons, Dragon Strike is actually way more in line with that than, than other adventure board games are. Um, and that's not to say that you can't have adventure board games that have decent mechanics and, you know, stuff like that in it, but you're just going to find that it's like this one was produced by TSR for an introduction, you know, thing. Because you actually have, they actually call the person the Dragon Master, which is similar to the Dungeon Master, and on the, and on the, the video on the Dragon Strike video, they actually tell you, like they actually say, like this is a special section for you know the tape for Dragon Masters only, and um, and then you know the the weird floating head dude actually tells you like what to do, like he actually gives you some really good tips on being a good Dragon Master, which you can then carry over to Dungeons and Dragons. So it's not like they, you know, like said, oh, hey, you know, it's like this is just a weird little adventure board game and uh, yeah, screw you guys. No, they actually made a decent, you know, board game and, and they actually told people like this is, you know, what we want to produce out, you know, like this is what we want you to remember, okay? Um, and this is what we want you guys to be able to do. We want you to be able to, you know, throw this out and be able to have it. So, you know, that way you're not just like, oh my gosh, what the hell? I don't know how to do this. So you may not learn much from the video, but there is that section for the Dragon Master, which is pretty nice. I think that's pretty cool. Okay. So that's basically what we're going for when we want to highlight Okay, stone. And if you want, you can actually bring this up a little bit further. 
Um, or if you wanted to paint it like a darker gray first and then bring up the lighter gray to kind of meld the two, you can do that. Um, like up on like say this part or this part. But basically what we're doing here is, is we're kind of going through and just kind of highlighting all of the, all of the raised areas. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to say, let's call that one. And then when we come back, which will be less than a second for you, but it will be a little bit more for me. What I'm going to do is, is, um, I'm going to paint her black. I'll let her dry a little bit, and then we'll come back and we'll start painting her. Okay? So, we will see you in less than a second. And we're back. Alrighty then. Well, so as we're looking at the... Imperial Mage right here, okay, as you can see, we're going to have some various, you know, like colors, and so we're going to start with the flesh color, um, and then we're going to go to the, um, the browns, and there's like some fur colors, and then there's some browns around here. And you can see that the bases are actually done up, um, but the actual base things that they give you don't have any of that. Now, what's interesting is, is that some of their new bases actually have this, um, actually have molded bases on the bottom, but these don't. Okay, so really we're looking at this. And we're also going to do the, the spell. So now, basically, <clears throat> in the game, it gives you some of the different spells that you can actually get within the actual Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Okay? And one of those spells that you can actually get within Elder Scrolls V Skyrim is Flames, the actual Flames spell. Um, and the... Um, Oops. Why don't you start with me? And I'm not have you falling apart on me. I super glued you. Don't you start with me. Um, so basically, what ends up happening is, um, is that in this game you can equip, just like you can in the actual game, you can equip two spells to your hands. So basically each person has two hands, a body, and then quick slots. Okay, And the quick slots can be things like potion and um, shouts, because they actually have a dragonborn figure. I didn't think they did, but they actually do. Um... And so, there's a lot of that kind of stuff going around, which is kind of cool. I actually thought that was actually pretty neat um, that they were doing with that. So, um, I might end up actually getting the Dragonborn figure. In fact, the Dragonborn figure that they have is really cool looking. Um, the, the one that they have on their website right now... Um, the, the Dragonborn figure that they have actually has, like, the tail of a dragon actually coming up off of the base from, like, right in front of the person, then it goes up and around the back side of their head like that. It's really cool. And so if you're thinking about getting this game, you might want to pick that up because this has two different modes. So... It's not just a typical, like, skirmish game where you could have, like, say, Imperials versus the Stormcloaks or, um, like, say, uh, Penius Oculatus versus the, um, uh, um, Dark Brotherhood, um, which I don't know if they have a Penius Oculatus yet, but, um, I knew that, I do know that they have the um, 
Dark Brotherhood Council, which has like Astrid and um, Nazir and Babette, um, Gabriella, Vizira, and Festus Crex. But the they have two different modes. So they have a quest mode or like a scenario mode where you um, you basically play as a um, as a skirmishing force, right? Where you can have anywhere between five and like twelve models. Okay, kind of an odd number, twelve. I mean, it's like five to ten or something like that, but. Um, you can have five to 12 models and, um, and those models can have varying, um, degrees of, you know, stuff to them. And you have a leader model or what they call it, or I think what they term a hero model and the, um, and then you have, or no, champion model. That's what it is. It's champion. So, like, for instance, in this box set, you can use the Imperial Mage as your champion, but you would probably most likely end up using Hadbar, just because Hadbar is kind of a little bit more of a better character. Um, and, uh, like, in the Stormcloak starter set, they have um, Rayloth. And what's interesting is, is that they've also released, so far, like an Imperial Champions set, where they have guys like, they have people like Legate Ricca, um, General Tullius, um, in the Imperial section, um, and a few others that you meet in the Imperial, if you join the Imperial Legion storyline against the Stormcloaks, the, the Civil War, um, the Skyrim Civil War. And on the other side of the, um, of the Stormcloak Rebellion, they have um, Ulfric Stormcloak, and they have a few others from that faction as well. Um, and then... Um, not only that, but they also have what's known as Delve Mode. Now, you're probably going, Delve Mode, what? Is that like going into dungeons? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Um, it's basically, you, um, you choose basically one or two heroes, and each person that you want to play, because you can play it solo, or you can play with friends. And you basically, you lay out the board, and then you, you have different objectives, and you set up these adversaries, which are basically like skeletons, draugr, whatever. You set those up, and you have your characters go to town on those particular things. So, like, if you have, um, you know, for instance, the, uh, like, you know, you can, you can actually, in the, in the original, um, in the box, in the core set, um, you get the rules for um, doing uh, the uh, Bleak Falls Barrow, the Golden Claw. Um, and so you can actually like go and and what's cool is is that on each quest mode you have a thing called an oath and the oath gives you victory points and then you have an event phase which gives you certain quests that you can complete and if you complete those quests then you get a certain number of victory points as well and whoever has the most amount of victory points at the end wins um now in the um, in the delve mode, um, you're completing those oaths together. So you want to make sure that you choose oaths that you think that you can complete as a team, okay? Because it's not like oh, I'm gonna race to get there first. It's more a case of I want to make sure that 
we all win because if it's it's either we all win or we all lose okay which i think was actually pretty neat um because basically modiphius based this game on their fallout wasteland warfare um miniatures game now the fallout wasteland warfare miniatures game went way overboard on the number of cards that they have now i don't have that i'm going off of what other people have have said about it but they went way overboard on the amount of cards that they have well I think they learned from that because they basically, for this game, they came up with basically a, a number of cards that works. So it's not so much that you're going to get lost in it, but it's enough that you can customize the characters how you want them to be customized. So, for instance, if you're playing as, you know, these guys, you get Imperial Legion armor, you get Imperial shields, you get Imperial swords. You get, you know, spell cards that are going to work for that stuff, you know. So it's and and all of your follower cards already have everything built into them. So you don't actually have to put anything onto those cards. Everything's already built into those, which I think is ingenious. I mean, that was as I was kind of reading through and I was kind of like looking at some of this stuff. I was like, um, that's actually kind of cool. Like, I don't have to worry about loading out every single figure I have because the following the follower cards for those already have that stuff on there plus they have adversary cards and what the adversary cards are is they're cards that are sort of like master enemies but like people like Hadvar and the Imperial Mage, Rayloff, and all those people have adversary cards. So if you don't want to play, like if you wanted to play a certain mode, you could play with Hadvar as an adversary if you wanted. Um, or you could play it, you know, different ways. So there's just a whole bunch of really, I mean, just the way that, that Modiphius did this, I was actually quite surprised when I started, um, like, uh, reading and, and, um, and kind of, like, learning the game. Um, now, it does use bespoke dice, but you get all of those dice in the box, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and you shouldn't need to have a set of dice for every single person. You can use one set of dice for every single person um, that wants to play. So it's not like you have to sit there and go, oh, gee, you know, I have to go out and buy a whole bunch of dice and do this and do that. Ugh, it's going to be such a nightmare. Nope, don't have to worry about that. Okay. You don't have to worry about that. You just have to worry about putting your um you know putting the stuff on so that you just have what you need um for your characters and then just go from there and i thought that was actually a really neat um idea by modiphius was having a game that was basically all in one so that once one person kind of learns how to play the game, they can basically teach everybody how to play, so that all a person would have to do if they wanted to play was just buy some figures and, you know, build them up and then start to play. I actually think that's a really neat idea. So... Um, that was actually what kind of got me into this, was I I took a plunge and I decided to buy the uh, um, um, the first, you know, sort of starter set for the Imperials, because usually when I play, I usually choose Hadbar, because I really like Hadbar a lot um, as a character. He's pretty neat. And um, so I bought, I bought the starter set, and I started putting the characters together, and I went... So there's no cards in here. I'm going to have to buy this. So then I bought that, and then when I found out that I could, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so now I have to see if I can get some friends in. Get some friends into it. Okay. So now I think what we're going to do is, <clears throat> is I'm... Not that 
one's gray and one. Two. Oh, come on, where's my brown? There it is. Uh, I'm going to take my melted chocolate. And that's going to kind of be my base coat for the leather color, okay? Um, and then, once we get that sort of worked out, um, then what we're going to do is, is we're going to, um, once we get that base coat on, then we'll kind of come back and we'll, um, we're, we'll shade it after we get some other colors on there, we'll shade it, and then we'll come back and we will actually highlight it using the different other browns that I have that are more in line with the browns that are on here, but they're very much highlight colors, okay? So we'll get there, but first we need to do the base coat for it. I mean, for being hard plastic, these miniatures are very, very detailed. I was actually ple pleasantly surprised at how um, good the detail was on these. Normally with hard plastic, they're very... Uh, they can be very um, finicky. Like a lot of Games Workshop, they're, they're hit or miss in Games Workshop land. They either get really, really detailed miniatures or they're just like really lacking in detail. And, and I was pleasantly surprised with these guys that they were very well done. And I thank Modiphius for putting the time in to make them a decent, decent miniature. Because, like, if you know Hadvar from the game, um, yeah, this Hadvar looks almost exactly like him, which I was really, really excited to see. And Rayloff looks almost exactly like Rayloff does. In the, in the game. So, I mean, they really nail the look. <sighs> now, the Dragonborn you'll be disappointed with because they made the Dragonborn a Nord. So, if you typically play the Dragonborn as a different character, well, you might be able to get away with proxying something but you're gonna have to find a, a character like if you want to play like an argonian or a khajiit you're gonna have to find someone like karjo or vizira to play your dragon form unfortunately because yeah, they the Dragonborn figures that they have will not be that. Now, another thing is, I don't know what these look like along the back. So I don't know... I'm looking at some different things, and I didn't think to pop 
boot up the game and take a look at it before I start painting. So we're just going to win. I think that if the front is more like leathery, I'm sure the back is too. I have to be careful of is where the fur starts. Because it's hard to see, but there's like a fur texture right there. And then right above the belt, there's a fur texture. So you have to be very, very careful of where you're getting your brown. Because if you don't want your brown, if you don't want fur, if you don't want the fur to be brown, then you don't want your brown color to be on the fur. Okay. You also have to be careful because there's a lot of like areas where there are red, um, like on the sleeves. And so you need to be very careful with that too, of where that goes and how that goes, blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying, you gotta be careful with that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Because if you don't, you end up looking really weird. And keep in mind, we will be highlighting this, so it's gonna it's gonna end up coming out in the wash anyway. But we just don't want to do something and then have it come back to bite us in the butt later. You know what I'm saying? But you do want to make sure that you get these little shoulder parts up on top of shoulder right here there's these little parts you can kind of see up here and underneath that is this little red portion right there under her like under her armpit and kind of like under there and, and that is like a red tunic that appears so like these little things go like this around, and then underneath there's like a little sleeve that's red, okay? So we want to make sure that we don't color that too much, because then that's going to make the color come out a little weird when we get to it, um, when we get to that part, okay? Because then we have to make more... to make more coats and I don't want to have to sit there and you know like paint it five or six times so let's be careful shall we I'm probably not gonna get this one done on this session because I'm going as fast as I humanly can and I'm not getting there so what we're gonna end up doing is we will probably end up getting as far as we possibly can, getting the base coats down, and then um, we will end up calling it an episode. And then what we'll do is, is when we get back, we will continue on with this, and um, we will you know, do things. Now, what I'm going to do is, <clears throat> for right now, <clears throat> is I'm going to move down to the skirt, okay? And here again, we're only hitting the individual plates on the skirt, okay? So we're just hitting these, these portions, just right, these two rows right here, okay? We're not going to get anything below, and we're not going to get anything above, and we're not going to hit the belt, because the belt, we're going to get with a different color, okay? Just because it'll make that step a lot easier when we get to it. This one, though, will be much easier to do. But we will want to make sure that we're getting each individual plate and leaving 
the black in between. Okay. I'll be able to get a little bit down in between, but don't get too much paint down in there because you don't want to overload this sucker with um, you don't want to overload this sucker with paint It'll just make it easier in the long run just to leave that shadowy kind of depth in there Sorry about that. Something on my tablet stopped. <laughs> Nothing that affects this, but it stopped. <laughs> I was like, this one was like, huh? I did learn. Okay, let me see here. Okay. What I'm going to do is get the rest of that here in a minute. Because what I'm going to end up doing, I'll just tell you right now, I'm going to paint the rest of the skirt because you can kind of see what I'm getting okay that's what we want to get okay I'm gonna get all that and then I'm gonna get the um, right around the feet I'm gonna get the boots um, with a different color but I am gonna get this front um, little pad right here okay because if you can see that the front pad has like a brown kind of base coat and then there's like a little bit of a lighter brown that kind of comes up from the bottom if you can kind of see that okay so that's what we're getting we're getting a dark brown here we're getting a dark brown up and around there we're getting a dark brown up on the hood we're getting a dark brown we're going to have a dark brown around the the hands because we're going to have um those things and then once we do that that's when we will go back and we will actually get um, the thing. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to paint, and I'm not going to do that today, but we're going to paint white around the front of this little bolt, okay? This little firebolt spell, okay? We're going to paint white around the front of that. And we're also going to paint white around the bottom of this fire, okay? Because if you look... If you see how bright that fire is, that's a white, okay? Now, they're also blending that out so that, that, so that it comes to a very, very white. So if you look at the very, very tip of the firebolt, so the firebolt spell comes out like this. If you look at the very tip of the firebolt spell, it's white. But if you look at the fire that's in the other hand, right? So the other hand's back like this. If you look at that fire, you look right around the base of it, it is very, very white. Okay, and then it comes up to more of an orangish color, orangish red up here. Okay, and that's what we're going to do is we're going to bring that color up. Okay, so, um, so we're going to do that too. Um, so what I'm going to do now is, um, I think... 
<clears throat> because she has red hair and she also has red clothing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to show you about where the red is going to be. Okay. And this is the reason why I'm using this particular um, brush because I want that that real fine tip, okay? And that's important because I want to get in and around sort of like that with the red. Okay, I know it's kind of hard to see because of the overhead light, but that's what we're looking for. Okay, we are we are trying to get. Um, let me can do this real quick. Can you kind of see the red in there? It's hard to see right now. But basically, right around the hood, okay, I put a little bit of red under, like, basically right in here and right in here, okay? Because the character on the box cover has red hair. So can you kind of see... Right there. Okay. The red hair. And then we're going to get this red right around here. Okay. And right up around here. Okay. That's what we're looking at. All right. And this is the base coat of red. Okay. Because we will highlight it later, but we need this base coat to kind of show us what we're going to do with this thing. Okay kind of gets the ball rolling on that, okay? The problem is my, my brush is, is real off right now. Rawr. Because it falls apart. First of all, all right, we're almost done here. I'm gonna start doing my outro. Thank you for watching. I have been Russ for Russ Plays Games. Smash that like button. Hit subscribe. Drop a comment below. Let me know what you think so far. And uh, let me know if you'd like to see more of these. Um, if you'd like to see me do all of them. Um, or if you'd like to see a specific one, like just a generic Imperial Soldier. Or if you'd like to see uh, Padbar, let me know. And we'll kind of go from there. When we come back, we will finish up uh, getting, getting these characters together. Okay? And so, um, I have a couple videos that are in the works. I ended up, um, I thought I got rid of, um, one, but I ended up deleting it. I ended up deleting one that I needed, and so I have to go back and refilm that. And so that will probably be in the next couple of days, and I'll hopefully get this up. In the next week or so since from, from filming this, I'm going to have a couple of these that I'm going to try to get up because I'm going to try to finish this character. Um, but when I come back, um, you will see most of it done. We will um, we will kind of continue from there. So, 
I hope you've had a fun time watching this, and we will see you on the next one.